No, not really. Uh, I think if it would be a safe internet if we understood more about it, about some of the pitfalls, the traps, uh, some of the kind of cybersecurity measures that we would need to put in place to be able to combat that. So, no, I think it is a bit of an oxymoron at the moment. It's If you think about this one thing, we received these devices early in 2007, i.e., you know, humanity did, and tablets in 2010. That's really a, a decade to 13, 14 years where there hasn't really been a curriculum in schools and there hasn't been a guide for parents. And the internet continues to evolve with new tricks and traps. So you have to stay frequently updated. Otherwise, the internet continues to be unsafe. Right. And it's difficult to teach this new curriculum when the teachers themselves are yet to learn it. <laughs> That's a really great point, Ayanda. Yeah, I mean, I think for adults, you know, we, we teach thousands, 4,000 students. We also teach the parents and we teach teachers and we teach mental health professionals. And in talking to the adults, to your point, you know, there is a huge amount of confusion. There is a generational and a technological divide between the adults and the kids. They don't understand that new form of popular culture. And arguably, it's the first time in history that kids are experiencing something at exactly the same type as their parents so that parents and teachers can't fully guide them. That I, we're sitting in at a real vantage point with our program at My Social Life in Schools because we get to listen to all of these people. We get to listen to the students and the teachers and the parents. And interestingly, you've mentioned it's for grade 8 to 11. We actually teach grade 4 to 7 and also grade 8 to 11. So we're ah. actually teaching pretty much all the way through prep and uh, high school. Yeah, and what are you finding are the difficulties, Dean? Um, I mean, it's easy to presume that uh, for the adults, it really does sometimes become some kind of culture shock. Um, I also imagine there are moments where, um, as irony would have it, the pupils end up teaching the teachers how to actually respond to certain developments. Yeah, I mean, I, I wish I... <laughs> I wish that were true, actually. But let me come oh. back to the first part of the question uh, in terms of the pupils, the teaching, the teachers. Because actually, um, there's a bit of a disconnect there with communication around devices. Kids are actually really fearful that their devices will be taken away or there will be a clampdown in schools. So I'll come back to that. But what are the things that, that are happening? Probably number one in schools that we see is cyberbullying. Um, so that could be something that happens during the day then gets taken online after school or something that happened after school then becomes a physical bullying inside. But then of course, uh, we've got issues around mental health. So kids are experiencing this huge life online but what they're doing is is that they're seeing uh, other people's lives their privilege their income their clothes their parties their boyfriends their girlfriends and what happens is, is that always reflects back at us like am i am i doing well enough well will i have that too um it's just a part of being human and and finally there's a lot of unwanted approaches so of course there's a lot of people that you know just getting a selfie from someone is is not enough people actually want to die up that social currency and ask for something more exciting or titillating. This really is a huge part of life. And, you know, that is each individual's choice. But the problem is, I'm saying as an adult, but the problem is with kids, they don't really know what deal they're getting into there when they start trading photographs, mm. because often they don't know who they're trading the photograph with. Often these are fake accounts or somebody betrays their trust after the fact. This is crazy stuff, seriously. It really damages um, kids' mental health sometimes. Yeah. One of the things that many governments across the world are struggling with is the ways to which the internet has broken boundaries and borders. Yeah, I'm talking about physical borders now. Here's a practical example. Usually, a law broken in some country on the internet is very difficult to enforce in another country. Are you finding those complexities emerging in the context of schools and classrooms as well? what a pupil does on the internet outside school, interfering with the rules of the classroom and the rules of the school. I under you 100% on the money. And that, that is actually what the schools and the principals tell us. They say, you know, mm. what are we meant to do? Um, because this issue happened outside of school. The, the challenge is, though, is that schools, do schools have relevant policy? Have they actually worked through that themselves? How clear is it? 
What are the consequences for it? Where does the school stand? What, what is its position? What's its point of view? And how concrete is that with respect to black and white about what they're willing to tolerate or not? And then how is it enforced? How is the policy brought into the school? How do I see whether you have a zero tolerance or whether you have a liberal uh, kind of attitude towards uh, a safer internet? That's not clear. And um, finally, you know, how do they back that up with, with respect to having a teacher that is a champion of this and really takes up the issues mm. and pe potentially takes things to the police or takes things up legally? You need ownership of this particular issue, mainly because there's four and a half billion people online. Yeah. And we have so many kids now really kind of piling into this online world, onto social media, onto devices, that we have to apply resources to it. Absolutely. Speaking about kids piling onto the platform, should we be worried about that at all? Or is that, you know, are we at a stage where we need to perhaps have a bit of a more progressive outlook on the time that children are spending on their cell phones? The knee-jerk reaction for people of an older generation, whom I don't speak for, is to try and curtail the time that is spent on the cell phone. But is that necessarily what we should be doing? No, no, we believe in uh, safer, smarter kids can explore and excel online. Yeah. But you actually only get to safety when you understand balance, when you understand self-regulation. So yeah, sh kids should be online, but they should be online on age-appropriate apps or websites. So they need to be the right age type of content. Otherwise, you're exposing yourself. You're consuming information and stimulus, which actually influences your psychology, your outlook, uh, if you experience enough of it. But what you've got to do is you've got to be able to uh, kind of see that certain types of content are really, really good for kids. But then at a certain stage when they have too much of it, uh, too much stimulation, then of course they can become really overwhelmed and they need to be able to very simply turn their device over. They need to be able to self-regulate. Now that's really difficult. Mm. But just like the school, if you bring this into your home, if you do monitor how much time they've got, if you do have these conversations, if you don't attack them and find them like, why do you live this crazy, inane digital life? Because a lot of parents say that to me, like, I just don't get it. I don't buy it. Sure, but that creates a disconnect. So what we've actually got to do is get closer to them. We've got to work out what apps they are using, when they're using them, how safe are they? Have they put their privacy and security settings in? Have they locked down the doors and windows of their device or the accessibility to them on the app, which is very simple. Just by going into settings and then down into safety and security, you can check whether they have private accounts or public accounts, whether anybody in the world can direct message them, whether people can automatically download their videos for example, on TikTok, onto their camera roll. You need to lock up the doors and windows, mm. and then you need to put in acceptable time parameters and get closer to them by talking to them at the dinner table. What are you experiencing online? I, I'm going to show you something from my world at work. You're not going to believe what happened. It allows you to do the teaching. Mm. It would be so remiss of us to reflect on what's happening on the internet on a day like this and not also reflect on what's been called the digital divide the amount of people sadly being left behind because they simply don't have access to devices that give them you know, an ability to even explore some of these safety issues. Are we making any strides, do you feel, especially in a country like ours? Ayanda, I think we are trying to make strides. Yeah. You know, we, the government and the Fourth Industrial Revolution Commission is doing what it can. I, I think the missing piece, though, I, I think we're going slower than, than we would like to admit, particularly when you look at other African countries. Um, but I think the real accelerator, funnily enough, is that when we do give these devices, and I think it will come, are we going to give them with the guide and the curriculum, like the one that we teach at My Social Life? Are we going to pair that? So when you get your device, you have to almost get your license. Um, and it's you know a basic set of skills on who are you going to be online? How do you set up your device? What are external cybersecurity threats? What can you expect in terms of influence through some of the content that you experience? What will your digital footprint look like as you go through? You make some big mistakes. It's forever on Google. It's really difficult to clear. So the answer to your question is currently no. I don't think we're moving at the right pace. Um, 
that's from a hardware point of view. Yeah. But I also don't think we're moving at the right pace at all with respect to digital education. I think we'd mark ourselves super low. Dean McCubrey, you've been great. And Thanks that's so what much. needs to be fixed. It's, it's been great chatting to you. Thank you. Great Thanks, insights Anna. this morning. Really appreciate it. Dean McCubrey is founder of My Social Life.